Mother, good morning, people. Good morning. I'm going to read you a prophetic word by Jordan Wells. We are in the midst of a global shaking, is what I heard the Spirit of God say. We are seeing everything that can be shaken being shaken. We are seeing shaking in Cuba, South Africa, Haiti, and across the globe. This time of shaking started to intensify in 2020 as we saw a global pandemic and a very controversial election. We are seeing uprising like never before, division and economic shaking on a level in other nations like never before. The shaking is global and is being seen in our day, news daily. We were told that in the end times that there would be times of shaking that would purify and prepare the bride of Christ for God's glory. That's what I believe these birth pains are. They are a signpost to the soon return of Jesus Christ and at the same time to prepare the earth for a global outpouring of the Spirit and an increase of God's glory. This will be a season of shaking. But in the midst of this shaking that I see continuing, I also see great miracles, signs, and wonders, an increase in the glory and global harvest. This post is not meant to cause fear, but to prepare the people of God for days of great testing and glory. This shaking is to separate the wheat from the tare and the sheep from the goat. God is about to do something in the nations through this shaking. He, I sense, is setting us up for a book of Acts visitation. So let's stay on our faces and pray like never before. Pray for these nations that are being shaken and wait with anticipation of what God is about to do next. Amen. He's setting us up for a book of Acts pre visitation, people. That's what we have been talking about. It's what we, why we've been teaching on the fire of God. And if you've not been here for these messages, I, I beg you, go to our YouTube channel. It's called Sanctuary Church of Jacksonville. And seek these messages out. Listen to them. Just You can listen to them while you're driving in the car, while you're doing dishes. Just don't waste any time. We have to prepare ourselves for what God is doing. And it's not just local, it is global. Before I get with the message today, um, I want to say uh, to the young people, I guess, Rocky, are you ready to take them to, to uh, Children's Church? They already left. Okay. So I guess we're staying here. Nope. I guess they're leaving. Okay, young people. Or you can stay and listen. I think it's important. You might want to stay. Okay, listen. Um, if you haven't heard the messages, please go and re-listen to them or, or listen to them for the first time. And join us for Wednesday night, vision night, and prayer. And I do believe that we need to get serious about prayer. Last week, we talked about fuel for the fire. And uh, in that message, it revealed the truth that prayer is the ignition key. It ignites the fire of the Holy Spirit within us, and it activates his power within us to work through us. It's through prayer. And I have to say that I believe that the average Christian is not living an active life of prayer. We're not serious, folks. And I'm telling you, this is, if you're ever going to be serious about anything, people are serious about a lot of stuff. They're serious about their golf game. They're serious about their favorite TV show. They won't miss it. They are serious about everything, but the most important thing we need to be serious about and set apart our agenda for God's agenda is time in his presence, in his word, and then pray the word, pray the will of God. And we've got to get serious about that. Uh, anything other than that is disobedience. We learned last week that uh, we are the fuel for the fire, that as we lay our lives on the altar as a living sacrifice, we lay aside our agenda, what we think is important, all of our offenses, everything that is evil inside of our hearts, we lay it on the altar and we say, Lord, burn it up, use it as fuel for the fire. Every, you can't do anything, nothing works. I was talking about last week how your car can be, have a full tank of gas, but if the ignition key isn't any good, it's worthless. Well, here's the other thing. That car has everything. I mean, it's thousands of dollars worth of stuff put together. And it's a magnificent machine, but it is worthless without the ignition key and without the fuel. And we got to give fuel 
to the fire if God's going to use us in these coming days. And uh, so as, as we take up our cross every day, as Jesus said to do, take up your cross daily and follow him. Crucify the flesh. Crucify your desires, your will, and lay it on the altar. And it's, as we do that, we become a fragrant offering that rises up to heaven. And we also saw last week that love is the conduit through which the power of God flows through us. And without love, you're nothing but a clanging cymbal. Noisy. You're just noise. You're talk, talk, talk. We don't need no more talk. We don't need more talk. Well, that's how you get the fire going. That's how you keep the fire burning. And that's how you can walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Right there. But today we're going to talk about the things that suppress or extinguish the work of God in our lives. It quenches the fire or extinguishes the fire. Have you ever thought of a fire extinguisher? It has one purpose, and that's to put out the fire. And believe me, there's a lot of things that put out the fire in our lives. We need to find out what those are because we do not want to be fire extinguishers. I don't. Amen? So, today... We're going to look at the life of King Saul. <clears throat> and as usual, I go through a lot of scripture. But um, I believe God's word speaks for itself. 1 Samuel 10, chapter 10, tells us how Samuel anointed Saul with oil to be the king, the first king, and the ruler of, over God's people. And his first and foremost responsibility was to destroy the enemies of God. You know, when we come into the kingdom, the Holy Spirit is lit in our hearts. And guess what? We have our first and foremost Responsibility is to destroy the works of the enemy, first in our own lives, and then God can use us to help others. Amen? He was supposed to destroy the enemies of God, including the Philistines, the Amalekites, and other uncircumcised, idol-worshipping nations that were, their armies were wreaking havoc in Israel. So let's begin with 1 Samuel 10, verse 1 through 11. It says, Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him saying, Has not the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? Then Samuel gave specific, he gave Saul specific instructions, which were to be fulfilled just as he said. When you leave me today, you will meet two men near Rachel's tomb at Zelzah on the border of Benjamin. They will say to you, the donkeys you set out to look for, have been found and now your father has stopped thinking about them and is worried about you he is asking what shall I do about my son then you will go on from there until you reach the great tree of Tabor three men three men going up to worship God at Bethel will meet you there one will be carrying three young goats another three loaves of bread and another a skin of wine they will greet you and offer you two loaves of bread which you will accept from them that's very specific. After that, you will go to Gibeah of God, where there is a Philistine outpost. As you approach the town, you will meet a procession of prophets coming down from the high place with lyres. That's not a lyre, but a machine, a musical instrument. Timbrels, pipes, and harps being played before them, and they will be prophesying. The Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Go ahead of me to Gilgal. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, but you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. As, Samuel turned to leave, as Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. And all these signs were fulfilled that day. When he and his servant arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came powerfully upon him and he joined in their prophesying. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, What is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? 
Well, you know, I don't know about you, but the people who knew me before Christ, and the, they, they got to, you know, see me after I came to Christ. It wasn't really after I came to Christ that there was this great change in my life. The change really came radically when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it blew my friends away. They couldn't believe who I was. I had been this fearful, kind of low-key person. All of a sudden, I'm just full of life and, you know, yap, 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 talking about Jesus. Amen? They knew there was, hey, what's happened to Connie? She's weird. But you know what? God proved to Saul that the prophet Samuel, his word, was true. And it was from God. It was from Almighty God. Therefore, it was to be obeyed. So he was supposed to wait for seven days for Samuel to offer the sacrifices to the Lord. So for, let's go to 1 Samuel 13, verse 5 through 14. The Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash, East of Beth Avon, when the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard pressed, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. So that's a freaky thing. There's a big army coming. I mean, they've got chariots, 3,000 chariots, and so many soldiers, there's no way to count them. That would scare anybody, right? But Saul remained in Gilgal, uh, Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings, and Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offerings. You know, Saul, because of fear, disobeyed God. God had spoken to him through the prophet Samuel. He had proven to Saul that his word was true by all of these exact things happening one after another, right? In spite of that, he did not trust in the word of the Lord because he had also said, God is with you. And it just makes me remember Gideon. I mean, they were fight, facing like 300,000 people. And God just made that army, uh, Gideon's army, just get down to 300 men. Because it wasn't the 300 men that defeated the, the, the enemies of God. It was the power of God. It was the angelic forces of God that destroyed God's enemies. Now, that's be, this is, uh, that was in the book of Judges. So Saul would have known this, Okay. Um, this is in the history of Israel. He would have known that. But, you know, fear is what caused him to disobey God. Fear. And fear always will cause you to sin against God. Fear is the opposite of faith. And the Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. So any decision you make based upon fear is sin. So any time that you get a word and it brings fear... It is compelling you to do the wrong thing. If you will get a hold of this, because that's what's happening all over the world. Fear is driving people to do the wrong thing. When you go to the doctor and he says, you have a cancerous tumor. Unless you get chemo right now, you will die. You will only have three weeks to live. Whatever. He is raising up fear in your life, and you will do whatever he says to do. It will be the wrong thing if you're motivated by fear. 
We always have to go to God. What is it we need to do, Lord? What are you telling me to do? I don't want to do what they tell me to do. I want to only do what you tell me to do. This walk of faith is learned one step of obedience at a time. And it's the same in every single person's life. No, there are no shortcuts to this. We all are tested along life's journey to see if we will obey him. He said, I felt compelled to offer up the sacrifice myself. He made a decision based upon his feelings. Do you know your feelings are affected by all kinds of external things and internal that have nothing to do with God? Your hormones could be messed up and you will be, you'll feel like killing somebody. If you act on that, you'll be a murderer. <laughs> you don't do what you feel like. We're not led by our feelings. We're led by the Spirit of God. He is, and His Word is a light unto our path, a, a, a lamp unto our feet. It's, he tells us what to do through His Word. But fear was, you know, Saul was a man of fear. And you can't, you know, in the natural, I don't blame him. I mean, in the natural, you know, you're looking at a vast army. You see your army is scattering. They're freaking out. They're fleeing. They're hiding in holes and rocks and wells and all kinds of places. They're not standing with you courageously. So he's thinking, I'm going to be left here all alone to face this mighty army. Well, even then, you should trust God. Because you know what? Fear causes you to sin. And it gives an open door to satanic forces that seek to destroy your life and hinder the work of God in you and through you. We need to have a healthy fear of sin. And what is sin, which we don't talk about in the church anymore? We don't talk about sin in the church. But it boils down to one thing. It's doing anything that God didn't tell you to do. That you do something opposite. You disobey God's word. So, you know, Saul, you got to ask him, how did all this happen? The man was anointed by God through Samuel. He, was, he had all that he needed to accomplish God's purpose for his life. How did it happen? Well, the first thing is he took his spiritual eyes off of God's word, spoken through his prophet, who had told him, don't worry about it, God is with you. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. And that's why we need to think about people like Gideon. But for us who know about other stories beyond this in the Bible, because, you know, Saul is the first king. But as we go through the history of the, the people of Israel, you have Hezekiah. And I believe it was one angel killed 180,000 men in Shennacherib's army. And then you have uh, Jehoshaphat who... Slaugh that God slaughtered <laughs> thousands and th hundreds of thousands of people. All they did was worship God, praise God. And you know, God did the work. And a whole army was decimated. Folks, we, God, if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. So, you know, here's the other thing with Saul is that he saw with the eyes of flesh. We got to be careful with that. Because he was looking at the Philistines who had 3,000 chariots. I mean, chariots were a powerful weapon of war. It's kind of like in World War II, the panzer division that Hitler had. Right? Put it in perspective. Here you got a bunch of Israelites who barely have a... a, a okay, some of them got slingshots. Benjamin, Benjamites were great at doing slingshots. And, and they had arrows. And they had spears. And, okay, so... But they had 3,000 chariots, and they had hundreds of thousands of people in their army. So his men were deserting him. His eyes were on what was going on around him, people. His eye, he was looking at everything through the eyes of flesh rather than the eyes of faith. Put yourself in this position, people. What are you seeing life through, the eyes of the flesh or the eyes of faith? It's good to see with the eyes of flesh what's going on in the world because it helps us to know where we are in God's timing of history. And it helps us to know how to place our priorities. It helps us to know how to pray. But it is not meant to bring us fear. Amen? 
So he's looking through the eyes of faith. He's, his people are hiding in caves. And the few that were remaining with him were quaking in fear. Out west, they've got, you know, in Colorado, they've got quaking aspens because when the wind blows just a little bit, it doesn't even have to be a mighty wind, just a little bit of wind. And those leaves quake. They look like they're quaking. They just, just a little breeze. And the, we, the leaves look like they're, they call quaking out aspens because of that. But these people were quaking in fear. So, you know, fear is contagious. That's what all this, you've got to stop watching the fake news, people. It is all under the control of the world government, the one world government, the, the elite at the top who own everything. Literally, they do. They own all of the stocks in all the major corporations. The major corporations own the stocks in each other. Coke and Pepsi, they own each other's stock. People... Why is it that all the corporations are woke? Because the people that control them are the people that are controlling the banks, the economies of the world. They're the ones that start the wars. <laughs> Get your eyes off the news. Do not watch it. Do not allow that into your eye gate. It will cause fear, and fear will cause you to do what they want you to do. Fear is contagious. I believe the mask is nothing but a way to cause fear. Just, you know, oh my goodness, we're in this, oh, we got to wear a mask because uh, we're all going to die. We're all going to die. No, we're not. We're not going to all die. So Saul felt compelled to disobey God because he relied on his feelings and he reacted to them. Folks, we cannot act according to our feelings. You know, if you're married, there's some days you want to, you feel like you can't live another day in that house. But you don't act on your feelings because tomorrow it's going to be okay. <laughs> we don't do what we feel like doing. Otherwise, there were times when I didn't feel like getting out of bed. I didn't want to face the day. I, I didn't want to face what I had to face. But God says, no. No, we don't act according to the flesh. or to the, Our feelings are exactly a part of our flesh. It's our mind, will, and emotions. And we'll always be defeated when we make our choices and decisions based on fear and feelings. Okay. So, what happens here? You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. For one second, I want to mention that man. We all know who it is, right? David. Now, David was not a perfect man, but one of the things that set him apart was his love for God. And because of that, when he was confronted with his sin, he always quickly repented. Amen? So God's not looking for us to be perfect because we are not. But those who love him are easily convicted of sin. If you're not easily convicted by horrible behavior in your life, then there's a good chance you don't have the Holy Spirit living in you or that you have become so hard-hearted that the Holy Spirit can't, you can't even hear his voice. So you're always going to be making those same decisions and choices over and over and over. But if you are faithful to obey God in the little things, then God will entrust you with very much more. But Saul failed the test. He failed the test. And we are faced with tests every day. Now, even though he failed the test, and God has now chosen David to be the next king, at this point in time, he's still king. Saul is still the king over Israel until further notice. Unfortunately, Saul did not learn his lesson. 1 Samuel 15, 1 through 35 says this. Samuel said to Saul, 
I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. Listen now from the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. So this is a direct word to Saul from God Almighty. And he says, I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up out of Egypt. Now the Amalekites were uh, descendants of Esau, Israel's brother, and they, when Israel left Egypt with Moses for 40 years in the desert, the Amalekites attacked the Israelites. And that's the story that Moses is standing there, and as long as he's holding up his arms in prayer, the Israelites are winning the war, the battle. But when his, he got tired, his arms came down, then the Amalekites were winning. But God, through uh, J uh, Joshua and the army of Israel, the Amalekites were defeated, but not utterly destroyed. But you know what? God has a very long me uh, memory. This is hundreds of years before. And he says, I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up out of Egypt. Now go. Attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. So Saul summoned the men and mustered them at Talim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 from Judah. Saul went to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the ravine. Then he said to the Kenites, Go away, leave the Amalekites, so that I do not destroy you along with them. For you showed kindness to all the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites moved away from the Amalekites. The, then Saul attacked, attacked the, the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur, near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. And all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely. But everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. You know what he did there? He compromised the word of God. And we do that. We compromise God's word to fit our own agenda. And it's called sin. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. <clears throat> I regret that I have made Saul king. But he, because he has turned away from me. And not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all that night. You see, when we compromise the word of God and we choose not to obey his word, we are turning our back on God. In order to come to Christ, you have to turn your back on sin and your past way of life. And how many people today have turned their back on God, on the people of God, the church, because they've been offended and they're not living for God anymore. Where does that leave them? One step of disobedience leads to another. And that's a fact of life. One step of disobedience leads to another. And I'm telling you, it gets. It's like a downward, like a sliding board to hell. Someone says, starts watching porn on their cell phone. One step of disobedience leads to another. Next thing you know, they're fornicating and doing other things. Next thing you know, they're entering into forbidden relationships. You don't know what those are? Look at the book of Deuteronomy. You end up in forbidden relationships. And you know, there's Christians whose children have become homosexuals. And you've got to love your kids no matter what. But the fact is, that didn't start on day one. 
It started way back when something else happened. And you turn your back on God. One step of disobedience will take you to the pit of utter destruction. I found myself there. I found myself in that place. And there was no way out. I couldn't climb my way out of that hell hole. Until God reached down and lifted me out of it. But once you've been in that hell hole, you don't ever want to go back. And you know what I said to God? When he got me out of that hell hole, I said, Lord, I've done it my way. And I've destroyed my life. And But if you'll take my life... And you do something out of the ashes of my life, I'll serve you for the rest of my life. I'll do it your way, God. I don't want to do it my way anymore. Unfortunately, it takes most of us that, that I hate it. I mean, I would love it if nobody had to experience that. But, and I'm going to tell you, my life of sin was very short. And today, I look like a saint. But no sin is okay with God. Fornication is a sin. Flee fornication, the Bible says. Flee idolatry, the Bible says. Flee the love of money, the Bible says. Don't even have lunch with a greedy person, the Bible says. Don't even meet up at Starbucks with someone like that. Because the love of money is the, kind, is the cause of all kinds of evil. So every sin is serious. There is no sin that is not serious. So why don't we hear any preaching in the church about sin? Oh, we've got to talk about the love of God. I don't need to because every other church is talking about the love of God. I'm sorry. Yes, God loves us, but he's a, God, a holy God, and there's a penalty for sin. In fact, it's called death. So, one, so every, early in the morning, you know what, here, bottom line is, people, we've got to have a healthy fear of sin. And sin, you know, I hear this, it's missing the mark. Yes, okay, it's missing the mark. But it's more than that. It's simply disobedience. God says, do this, and you don't do it. You just don't do it. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. You're not going to believe this one. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone down to Gilgal. Instead of giving God glory for the victory over the Amalekites, he sets up a monument for himself on Mount Carmel, the place where Elijah defeated the prophets of Baal. You see, his desire for position, for power, prestige, honor, all these things will always cause you to put yourself out there as somebody super important. And that's called sin because God says, I'll share my glory with no man. So when Samuel reached him, Saul said, the Lord bless you, Saul. Saul sees Samuel coming. He says, hey, Samuel, the Lord bless you. Sounds real Christianese. Christianese. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of the cattle that I hear? And Saul answered, uh, well, the soldiers brought them from the, the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your, your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. So in this point, Saul is utterly deceived. He's a man who compromises the word of God to fit his own agenda. He places blame on other people for his unwillingness to obey God's word. He uses religion as an excuse to sin. Oh, he's going to sacrifice. Oh, they saved the best of the sheep and cattle so we could offer it up to the Lord, your God. And as God said to Samuel, he said he has turned his back on me. He's turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. And you know, we can do a lot of good things all in the name of Christianity. 
And we got to be careful, people, because Jesus said many in that day, when? When? The end of the age, when he's judging people. He says many in that day, not a few, not a handful, not a remnant, a lot, will say, but God, didn't we preach in the choir and sing in the, uh, I mean, preach in the pulpit and sing in the choir and teach Sunday school and lead worship on Sunday? And didn't we do all these wonderful things? And he says, be gone from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Why? Because they, the, the attitude of their heart was not, for, not out of love and faith, but out of what's in it for them. Prestige. Want to be seen in front of people. Whatever. Samuel's had enough. I mean, he knows the guy's lying. He's so deceived. He says, enough. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And he sent you on a mission, saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? The guy is delusional. He says, but I did obey the Lord. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. Uh, you would do that in a normal war because it's kind of like your trophy. When you bring the king back alive, it's like it's a trophy that you won the war or the battle. The soldiers took the sheep and cattle from the plunder. I didn't do it. Kind of sounds like Adam and Eve. Put the blame somewhere else. I'm sorry, you're the king. One word from you, and they would not have taken the plunder. And I guess he forgot about Achan, who, when Joshua took the Israelites across the Jordan River and destroyed Jericho and everything there, the same commandment, everything was devoted to the Lord for destruction. But Achan saw some stuff he wanted, gold, silver, and some nice robes. So he took it hid in his tent. And we know the effect of that sin of one person. The whole tribe, all the tribes of Israel were punished. Because when they went out to defeat the small town of Ai, they were utterly defeated. Because of the sin of one person in the camp. God is serious about sin, people. That is why You know, we want the glory of God to be in the house. We want signs and wonders. We want to see God move in a powerful way. But he will not inhabit a place of sin, un of compromised Christianity. And that's what we have in the church today in America, compromised Christianity, among other things. We've made excuses. We've made doctrines that basically tell people it's okay. Love covers over a multitude of sins. And there's no requirement of you to live a, a life of holiness and obedience to the Lord. And that's why there's a 50% divorce rate in the church. So, he said, I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought Agag their king. The soldiers took the cattle and sh the sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. You can hear his, his voice, your God, not my God. I'm sorry, if God is not your God, then he's not your God at all. Is, you know, God is my God, and I happen to be his favorite. So we need to all have that same feel. You know, it's a feeling, but it, your faith becomes the right feelings. Amen? So, so, but Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the, the Lord? 
Does he really care that you come to church every Sunday and read your Bible and speak in tongues and sing in the praise group? Does he really care if you're going to walk out that door and live a life of disobedience? No. He says to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed the voice of the Lord is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as like the sin of divination or witchcraft and arrogance. The arrogance, the arrogance that past some pastors are living a double life. The arrogance that a man who is leading a church, a massive church, has an, a mistress living a completely double life. The arrogance to believe that you can be a believer and live in Sin. Ask how many people in a mega church, and I'm any church, how many are living in sin? Let's just start with the easy ones. We know it's a sin to fornicate. Anything outside of marriage is fornication. Well, 40 years ago, when they did a survey of Protestant pastors, 40% admitted that they were hooked on internet pornography, not internet, but pornography. Back then there was no internet. If you can imagine what it is today, you cannot get any more vile, vile than watching pornography. It is vile and you dare to speak to God's people in a pulpit and live that kind of life? If it's the pastors doing it, what does the church look like? Why is no power in the church? You've got the blind leading the blind, people. You want to know why you don't hear sin preached in the church anymore? Because the pastors are living in sin. And I'm not saying all pastors, obviously not. There are men and women of God who fear God. When Jim Baker went to prison... After he'd had an affair, he was, he was set up. He was set up. So he has an affair and the, comes out in the public. By the way, the board of directors of his ministry, the 700 P PTL, <laughs> unbelievable, were pay, they were all paid board of directors men they don't want to lose their pay so they hit it they're willing to pay shut up money shush money but it all came back to bite them folks you know what he said after he repented and thank god he did repent but you know what he said he said i loved jesus jesus says if you love me you will obey my command so even that's deception. You didn't love Jesus. But I can't tell him that because he's on the television. He said, but I never feared God. I never feared God. Because he was raised up on a diet of sloppy agape. Like a lot of the church. So, so, Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in all this? Heck no. For rebellion is like the sin of divination or witchcraft. Why? First of all, it is out of uh, arrogance. Arrogance that we turn our back on God and we do it our way. We think we know better than him? No, we don't. And it will lead to destruction. But here's what, guys, you don't understand how serious sin is. Every time you willingly choose, now we all sin accidentally, and we're all a work in progress, and God is merciful, and we have the Holy Spirit to bring us to repentance, and we have his word pointed out to us, and we have the opportunity to repent, but without repentance, there is no forgiveness. You must humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. You must come to him and, be, and, and, and confess your sins so that he can forgive you, and so that you can be healed. But every time you purposefully, knowingly open yourself, you sin 
knowingly. You know this is a sin. You know it's a sin to lie. You know it's a sin to cheat on your taxes. You know it's a sin to fornicate, commit adultery, look at pornography. You know these are sins. And you keep doing them. You do it one time. You have just opened yourself up to demonic forces. You are now under the curse. This is serious sin is disobedience. Look at Deuteronomy. If you obey me, I will pour out all these blessings on you. You will be blessed in the country, in the city, in your comings, in your goings, when you get up in the morning, when you, and your enemies will be defeated before you. One can, send a tel- can destroy a thousand. But you know what? If you disobey God, you're under the curse. You're not under the blessing of God. Now the enemy has an open door into your life. When I got set free from cigarettes, which is very difficult to do, but God did it, I was tempted one time to smoke a cigarette because some friends were over, and, I, and the Holy Spirit said, Connie, if you smoke that cigarette after I've delivered you, you are God giving Satan permission to give you cancer. You've just given him the go sign. Permission. We do not realize how desperately evil sin is. And by the way, it flows down from generation to generation. It's, it, it brings a curse on you and your family. You're giving access. It's divination and witchcraft. The spirit of Jezebel. And by the way, we're crying out to God for the spirit of Elijah to come here and take over our lives and use us in the same way he used Elijah. But he can't when there's a spirit of Jezebel. And Jezebel is the spirit of divination and witchcraft and disobedience and anything God, holy. But he says, rebellion is like the sin of de- and arrogance like the evil of idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has rejected you as king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. He finally admits it. I have sinned. Oh my gosh, I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid, here now he's going to make excuses. I was afraid of the men. And so I gave in to them. Okay, he's the king. And he's afraid of the men. He's a man driven by fear. What are your fears, people? Let's face our fears because it is an open door to sin. Amen? Amen? Now listen, this is a hard word, but people, we've got to hear the truth. It's meant to help us. God wants to see us live a life of victory. Then Saul said, and by the way, he says, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. We are called to be a kingdom of kings. And priests, when we know who we are in Christ, you are a king and a priest. God's given you authority in the earth, and you will have more authority based on your faithfulness on this, in this life in the, in the new kingdom. Amen? So it's important that he doesn't reject us as a king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I, I have sinned. Okay, we saw that. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe and tore it. Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, but he, because he's not a human being, that he should change his mind. Saul replied, again, I have sinned. I sinned. But please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel went back with Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. Now, what's his motive for going back? He wants to be honored. He doesn't want to be ashamed in the presence of the people. 
Then Samuel said, bring me Agag, king of the Amalekites. Agag came to him in chains, and he thought, surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so will your mother be childless among women. And Samuel put Agag to death before the Lord at Gilgal. Then Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul went to his home in Gibeah of Saul. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go back to see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him. And the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. So what does that say to us? First of all, the anointing of God is what empowered Saul to fulfill his calling. And it's the same with you and me. His giftings and callings are irreversible, irrevocable. God will not take them back, but it's his anointing on our lives that empowers us to fulfill God's purpose for our life. You have a purpose. It's not my purpose. It's the purpose God has for your life. And God wants every single person to walk and fulfill the purpose he has for their actual being born into the world and born into the kingdom of God. So it's the anointing, and he was called to be a warrior king to deliver the people of God from their enemies. God has given us the same calling. We are all called to be in the army of God. We are army of God. That's why you've got put on the full armor of God. What do you need armor for if you're not in a war, if you're not in a battle? We need to put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit, the boots, whatever. We need all that. Why? We are in a war. For the soul of our nation, for our, the souls of our children, our grandchildren are perishing. They're perishing, people. And, but in order to fulfill his calling, the calling on his life, he needed a personal relationship with God. He could not rely on someone else's faith, namely Samuel's. And you and I are the same way. We have a personal relationship with God. He's made that possible through the blood of Jesus. When the curtain was torn, Jesus paid the price so that we could have a personal relationship with Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and with the Father. He said, I came that you may know the Father. Get to know God through his word and through intimate time with him. Because he did not trust in God. Put yourself in his shoes because this is the church today. He became a man driven by fear. He compromised the word of God to fulfill his own agenda. He was fearful of losing his face before his men. He was fearful of losing his position. He was fearful. Hear that word fearful? Fearful of losing his position and his honor. He became envious of David. You see, when all, what matters in your life is how important you are, then you're going to be envious of other people who God is blessing and you know what? He wants to bless you, but blessing comes in a, through obedience. He, he eventually became a murderer. I mean, he wanted to murder David, but he also murdered or had the priests murdered by, guess what? An Amalekite. He was a murderer. And you know, he eventually, you talk about witchcraft, he eventually sought help from the witch of Endor. And after that, he and his righteous son, Jonathan, his sons, all, were all killed at the hands of the Philistines, at the hands of the enemy. They should have been victorious over the enemy. But when you don't have the anointing, you're going to be defeated by the enemy. The anointing will only remain on a, an obedient child of God. The anointing leaves that which is disobedient. And he lost the kingdom. And you know, I think there are so many, there's so much false teaching out there. And you know, the church has been so busy in the last hundred years pursuing the American dream instead of the kingdom of God. And you know, I don't want to lose the kingdom, the one that will never pass away. We are to be kingdom kids. We are kings and priests of an eternal kingdom. And if you want to walk in this eternal power, the power of Elijah in these last days, come on, people. 
Obedience is the fuel for the fire. And disobedience is the fire extinguisher. Disobedience for any reason. Disobedience for any reason will extinguish the fire of God in your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace with a grateful heart for all you have done to set us free from the kingdom of darkness. We thank you that you have given us ears to hear what you're saying to the church today. Father, we want to be your vessel of mercy on the earth, especially during this time of great revival. We desperately need a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit in our own personal lives. We desperately need the conviction of the Holy Spirit that we would recognize sinful attitudes and behaviors so that we might repent and come clean before you, God. Father, convict us of the sin that comes from fear. Forgive us for not trusting in you and your love for us. Forgive us for the sin of compromise. Forgive us for the sin of pride, arrogance, and the desire for man's approval. Forgive us for our disobedience, especially as we respond to the word you have spoken in these last days. As David prayed, so we pray. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me to the way everlasting. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Send your fire, O God. Send the fire of the Holy Spirit to cleanse us, to burn up all idolatry, to destroy the works of the devil in our hearts, and set us ablaze with a passion for the lost and hurting. We ask all of this in the precious and magnificent name of Jesus, the pioneer of our faith, the one who endured every temptation, who suffered, suffered, suffered so much on our behalf, God. Oh, God. Change our hearts and make us holy. Give us clean hands and pure heart that we may ascend to the holy hill of God. Give us pure hearts that we may see you in all of your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need prayer, please feel free to come forward and our prayer team will be here to minister to you.